or before class. Some people discovered some things they wanted to change because they said really they don't seem to Alright, so we just finished this last time. So Renin is released by what cells? That's the glomerular cells, right. So what happens is those glomerular cells release renin when we get a decrease in blood flow to the kidney. So if we get a decrease in blood flow to the kidney, then then GBHP would go up or down? Down. Down. And if GBHP goes down, then GFR would go down. So if GFR goes down, then the amount of filtrate being produced is going down. So what happens when you get a decrease in blood flow to the kidney is you get a drop in, in, in filtrate production. And then that's what the macula densa responds to. And then the macula densa communicates with the juxtable glomerular cells. And then they release renin. The liver produces uh, this compound angiostensinogen. And it's in your blood all the time in an inactive form. And it's one of the large proteins that you don't want to pass through the filter. So what happens is when juxtamarinol cells release renin, it converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, that then is circulated into the blood to what organ? The lungs. And in the capillary beds in the lungs, we have a enzyme called ACE, which is angiostensin converting enzyme. And ACE converts angiostensin 1 to angiostensin 2. And then it's a vasoconstrictor. Uh, and when you, vasoconstricting at this point, I think it can get confusing because you can vasoconstrict in one area of your body. So, for example, if if we talked about if you had a hemorrhage, then what you want to do is keep core circulation up. So you're going to start vasoconstricting in your arms and legs and decrease blood flow to those, which is why people's hands eventually get cold and clammy and you can't feel radial pulses because you started adjusting your, your circulatory pattern. So if, if we have a decrease in blood flow to the kidney, we could constrict blood vessels in our extremities, increase core circulation, which would increase circulation to your kidney. So then the other thing angios, this, this does, Angios Institute does, is it, is it causes aldosterone to be released from what organ or gland? The adrenal gland. And what, what part of the adrenal gland? The adrenal cortex. And then ADH, which is the one I forgot to put up here. So make sure you write ADH in this, which is anti-diuretic hormone. And it makes you pee more or pee less? Pee less. All right. And where is it produced? By the pituitary gland, right? Where do I write that? In this box right now, showing that this, this compound promotes the release of both aldosterone and ADH. And then just to fill in the picture, ADH is released by the posterior pituitary. And aldosterone is released <coughs> by the adrenal cortex. And then both hormones, ADH and aldosterone, target the same cells. So what cells do ADH and aldosterone target? Principal cells. And where are principal cells found? In the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule. So in the latter part of the, of the nephron, right? And then even though they target the same cell, they have an opposite effect. They have different effects, excuse me, not opposite effects, different effects at those cells. So what is ADH to? Something about water things. Aquaporin, yeah. So it causes us to to release aquaporin. So the water can Right. So remember, we talked about the fact that membranes are bipolar layers, and 
this is a nonpolar region. And water is a polar molecule. And so even though water is small enough, it can move through a membrane. If you, if you remove this resistance by creating a little channel protein, then the water can move quicker. So what aquaporin does is facilitate the movement of water to the membrane. And then, AD, then aldosterone does what? To its principal cells. Increases the absorption of sodium? Yeah, it increases the absorption of sodium. Because water is always going to move by osmosis. So if the water is in our lumen, and, and this is the membrane of our principal cell, then as we add more water into here, then there's less water out here. So our osmotic gradient changes over time, right? So if we can actively transport sodium in here, out of the lumen, then we, we maintain our, our osmotic gradient so that we can keep moving water, right? So ADH does the sodium? No. Ah. Aldosterone does the sodium. ADH <coughs> does the aquaporin. Okay. All right. Are you, are you, are you sure? <laughs> I think I wrote it backwards. I'm Boston. The the aldol <laughs> As I know right now. The aldol is the aquaporin. No. no, no. <coughs> ADH does aquaporin. Aldosterone does sodium reabsorption. But in answer to your question, am I, am I sure? I'm only as sure as what I know at this point. And if we learn something new, then I'll be less sure. Later. <laughs> All right. So I, these are so cool because they they summarize everything, make you think about it. So so they always start at homeostasis. So we like to maintain homeostasis. So we like to maintain a normal GFR. So what's a value? What about value do we use? 125 mL per minute. So we like to be able to filter 125, 125 mLs of water out of our blood through our filter system, right? So that's our goal is to maintain that. So what happens if we get decreased blood flow to the kidney? Then GBHP is going to go down. GFR is going to go down. So we'll no longer be doing 120 per minute, right? But our body likes to do <coughs> homeostasis. So what your body's going to do is try to adjust to maintain GFR, right? Uh, and so we would get a decrease in filtration pressure, a decrease in filtrate in urine production. So what would happen is there'd be less filtrate passing over the macula densa, which would trigger the macula densa cells to communicate with the juxtable marrow cells. And the juxtable marrow cells are going to produce Renin. And renin's going to convert a, a protein produced by the liver, angiostensinogen, to angiostensin 1. And then it's going to go where? To the lungs, where an enzyme in the capillary beds in the lungs called ACE is going to convert angiostensin 1 to angiostensin 2. See, these are cool flowcharts, but there's date, there's stuff behind the scenes you got to think about. So what we know is that angiostensin 2 levels would increase the adrenal glands production of aldosterone. And then what aldosterone is going to do is target what cells in the distal convolutinal collecting duct principal cells to increase their reabsorption of sodium, which is going to create a osmotic capacity to move water from the lumen of the tubule and put it back in your blood. So since we had a decrease in blood flow, because we had a decrease in blood volume, then our goal is to recover blood volume. And we would do that by making less urine and putting more of the water that would have been urine back into our blood, right? 
So then the other thing that angiotensin 2 does is it, it targets thirst centers in the hypothalamus. And it makes you think you are thirsty, which would make you want to drink more. So if you increase your consumption of liquids, then you can eventually move those through the gut lining into your blood and return blood volume. And as angiotensin 2 levels elevate, it also targets the posterior pituitary, causes it to release ADH. And then ADH is going to target what cells? Principal cells. And the principal cells are going to, going to do what then? Produce a membrane protein called aquaporin, which is going to facilitate our movement of water through the membrane so that we can increase our fluid reabsorption or retention. And then it also has a sympathetic reflex. And the sympathetic reflex would tend to do some constriction of venous reserves. So your biggest blood reserve is in the capillary beds in your skin. So when you've lost core circulation, one of the first places you're going to try to recover that is from your skin, which is why your hands get cold and clammy if you're in a real bad state of dehydration uh, because of that. And then the other thing we could do, which we haven't talked about, but, but blood volume is related to blood pressure. But we can also deal with blood volume by increasing cardiac activity. So we can actually speed up your heart rate. So if we speed up your heart rate, we're going to speed up, we're going to increase your blood pressure. And even though we don't have as much volume of blood. Which is why if you did come on someone who's bleeding and are beginning to go through a hypovolemic shock, and you do get, you can't feel a radial pulse, but you get a carotid pulse, it's not going to be going bump, bump, bump. It's going to be going because your heart's going to try to accelerate the rate it's working to pump the blood. You have less blood to pump, so if you pump it faster, you can, you can, you can drive pressure back up. Does that make sense? Cool. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to spend a couple minutes, and then we'll go on. Um, so we have a loop of Henley because it's a counter current system. So we have the filtrate traveling down the descending limb and traveling up the ascending limb. To make sense out of it, there's three principles you have to understand. Anything that is thin, the thin descending limb and the thin ascending limb, is freely permeable to water, and water moves by osmosis. It is impermeable to solutes. So solutes can't move. So in this, in this area, water can move either direction depending on the concentration gradient, but ions cannot move through. So solutes are, are, not, are impermeable. When we get to the thick part of the ascending limb, Henley, it becomes impermeable to water, but solutes are actively transported. And so active is the key word there. So why, what do I gain by doing active transport instead of diffusion? Energy. Concentration gradient. I uncouple myself from a concentration gradient. Diffusion always requires a compound to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. But with active transport, I can move a compound from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration because I expend energy. So, so if I use active transport, I uncouple myself from, from that concentration gradient, which means that I can actually move sodium chloride against the concentration gradient because I'm actively transporting, right? Okay. So those are, that's the one premise to, that you have to understand. So permeable to water, impermeable to solutes, impermeable to water, 
active transport of solids. Okay. Now then, the second thing that is important, and I was looking actually for a different picture. I like this one. All right, is that this magic line is our interface between our our medulla, which is down here, and our cortex, which is up here. So I have arteries and veins that I find, and we really define this boundary for our, the arteries. So I um, see the arteries in here. Is that in those pyramids, we actually use urea to create a concentration gradient. So what we do is we increase the amount of urea as we go down toward the papilla. So that what we can actually do is we can use urea to create a concentration gradient for us. So if we look at concentration gradients, these are expressed, these numbers are expressed in, in milliosmoles. So without going into milliosmoles in detail, the larger the number, the more concentrated the solute. Okay. So we start at a milliosmoles of 300, and we go to milliosmoles of over a thousand, which is re reasonably concentrated. All right, and we're using urea and other other solutes to do that. Okay. So what's kind of clever with our system, even though urea is a waste product, we want to get rid of. We'll actually take urea out of the collecting duct and recycle it back in to this lower level of the pyramid to help maintain this concentration gradient. So we actually use urea, we can recycle urea to create this concentration gradient for us. So it's a waste product we want to get rid of, but we wouldn't ever want to get rid of all the urea, because then we couldn't maintain this concentration gradient. So if you took, if you if you went to a butcher shop and got some pig kidneys or, or, or cow kidneys, some people eat kidney, a kidney pie out of it, and you boil it, it just smells like urea because the, the kidney is pretty loaded with urea. Yeah. So what's pretty fascinating is that if we can create a concentration gradient and it's freely permeable to water, then what, what direction is water going to move? Toward the highest concentration, right? So water is always going to move from an area that's hypotonic to an area that's hypertonic. And I'm using urea to create my hypertonic situation. So what happens in the thin part of the descending limb of Finley is the solutions want to become isotonic because water is going to move from an area of hypertonic to hypertonic situations. And water is going to try to move. And so what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate our urine. So we end up with a real concentrated urine at the loop, right, in the loop of Henley at the bottom of the end here, of about 1,200 milliosmoles, because we moved water but not solutes. All right? So now as we go upward, we can actually stop the movement of water in the thick ascending wheel, and now expend energy to move solutes. So what that allows me to do is to take the solutes out of solution, and retain the solutes. And the solutes I want to retain are sodium and chloride because sodium is so fundamentally important to your body for any depolarization event on any membrane. Right? So we, we retain sodium because we've got to maintain blood sodium levels that allow us to do depolarization events. And so what we're going to do is make our urine more dilute, but not by moving water, but by actively transporting solutes. So what we're able to do is recover sodium but keep urea as one of our main solutes in our urine. So we're, we're, it's, a, it's an exchange. We're, exchange, we're using active transport. We're, we're actually able to exchange certain solutes and retain some as, as the main solute. Why do we keep the chloride? Because you have to be electrically done. So if you if you have a, if you have a plus ion to your body, you want to cover it with a negative ion. So even chloride is important to some functions, but its biggest probably function in your body is keeping you electrically balanced. Right. 
Right. So then what happens is we get into the distal convoluted tubule and inflector. Mm -hmm. And now what happens is water movement isn't simply dependent upon osmosis, but it's dependent upon the presence of hormones. So that you end up with a hormone-based water reabsorption. And because it's hormone-based, then you can control it. Whereas osmosis, the only way you can control osmosis is trying to control concentration gradients, right? Right. So when we when we look at the the uh, when we look at the nephron, then we can think of water movement as being obligatory water movement. And that means that it has to happen anywhere where you're using concentration gradients to move water. Water movement is obligatory. So obligatory water movement occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule and the thin parts of the loop of pinna, right? So the other way we could move water would be facultative water movement. And in facultative water movement, you can control the movement of water. So any hormone-based water movement is, is facultative. So then the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct become facultative water reabsorption. Does that make sense? Like you say, requires energy to move the water. It's controlled by hormones. The water movement is. No, for the facultative. Right. In facultative water reabsorption, it's not so much that you're using energy as you're 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 controlling the process with hormones. ADHN. Aldosterone. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And what that does is allow us to actually concentrate our urea in our urine and save the other solutes like sodium chloride. So it's a countercurrent system uh, because uh, it travels against this concentration gradient. Right? And then what we do is why we have a peritubular capillary is because the sodium and chloride that we, we retain out here, we can put back in our blood and transport. So we have a paratubular capillary so that the things that we're taking out of the nephron to retain get put back in our blood where they can be transported to the rest of our body. So we have to connect our paratubular capillary and our nephron together in, in that function. Okay, so this stuff is just a reiteration of what was on that table. So if anybody has any, any questions about those, I can tell you for you. But what I was trying to get at in terms of faculty versus obligatory uh, is the fact that it's under a hormone, ADH, so 5% in the distal family to be is, is controllable movement of water. So there's one other cell that I want to talk about, uh, and I'm just going to talk about it briefly. And then we're going to make sense out of it on Tuesday. So one of the things that we said the, the kidney was responsible for was maintaining blood pH. So if you're maintaining blood pH, you're managing hydrogen ions. Right? Because pH is a measure of hydrogen ions in solution. So the kidney has to have a way of managing hydrogen ions. So what we have then is a relationship where, where in the lumen we have hydrogen ions that are part of the fluid that we filter, right? And we, we can test that with a dipstick and urine because we can test for the pH of the urine. So somebody whose urine pH is 4 or 5 is putting a lot of hydrogen ions into that urine. And that you indirectly tells you that there's something going on in their body that's generating hydrogen ions, and that's why they're getting, trying to get rid of it, right? Whereas somebody whose urine is real basic about pH is, is doesn't have that abundance of hydrogen ions, right? So what we have is we have intercalated cells that are uh, modified cuboid cells that are in our distal convoluted tubule and are collecting. And what they do is they, they play a game uh, with hydrogen. And so if your blood is too acidic, they will secrete hydrogen 
to the urine and it'll drive your urine to become acidic. So that's why when you got somebody who's got acidic urine, you indirectly know that they've got some hydrogen ions in their blood. Because that's what these intercalated cells are doing. They say they're dumping hydrogen ions in their blood. Well, long story short, the other way you can manage a hydrogen ion is with a buffer. So in, in a chemistry lab, we use buffers to manage hydrogen ions. So the simplest definition of a buffer is a compound that will absorb hydrogen ions. All right. So the buffer we use in our blood is bicarbonate. Okay. So bicarbonate is a very important buffer in our blood. So what happens in our blood is we carry <coughs> sodium ions and we carry bicarbonate. So what we carry in our blood is a dissolved sodium bicarbonate, which is a standard buffer that we would use in a chemistry lab. <laughs> right? So if you go home and you, took, and you look at baking soda and you read the ingredients on baking soda, baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. So if you're ever at home, have bad acid indigestion, no tums or lades or any of those in the house. A little warm water, a little baking soda. And voila. You have a buffer. You have a buffer your ran acid. Right? So what happens is that if we have hydrogen ions in solution and we have this sodium bicarbonate in solution. And what we can do is remove the sodium. We can attach the hydrogen back to this, and we'll end up with a compound, which is a weak acid called carbonic acid. And what carbonic acid likes to do is dissociate to form water and carbon dioxide. <laughs> so what I can do is I can take hydrogen ions, put them on the bicarbonate, and eventually get one, <laughs> which takes care of my, the problem I have, which is hydrogen ions, right? So what, what is equally important then for your intercalated cells is to secrete the hydrogen ions to the urine to try to recover or manufacture bicarbonate ions. So what the intercalated cells want to do is they want to put bicarbonate back in your blood but put the hydrogen ions into the urine. And by doing that, they can adjust blood pH. Okay, and then we're gonna talk more about that in detail um, on Tuesday. Yes? Can a, a compound that neutralizes this alkaline solution be considered a buffer? Yes. So, a classic buffer system can either absorb hydrogen ions or hydroxyl ions. Yes. And the way you do it in a chemistry lab, which I didn't get into the detail here, is you have to use a weak acid and the salt of the weak acid, which is the base. And then you combine the weak acid and the salt of the weak acid together to form a buffer. And it's the one place where you have to use something you learned in math to cover out the equation to calculate how much weak acid and the salt of the weak acid you need to make the buffer. So. All right, so there are three principal things that we depend upon our respiratory system to do. The first is pulmonary ventilation. And that's just the movement of air in and out of our body. So we want to move air in, we want to move air out, and we want to move it in and out at a fairly periodic rate. So it's an average respiratory rate. So, I think 14 to 20 minutes. Something like 60 would be a little higher. That would be your average. All right, so moving air in and out. So then what we do is we move air in and out of an airspace. 
And associated with that airspace, we have capillary veins. And what we want to do is we want to move oxygen out of the airspace into the capillary veins. And we want to move carbon dioxide out of the capillary bed and into the airspace. And that is all done by diffusion. Diffusion always retires a concentration gradient. So, so external respiration is the exchanges of gases between the pulmonary airspaces and the blood. Now, once we get it in our blood, what we're going to do is we're going to then depend on our heart to transfer that to a tissue. So then in the capillary bed of our tissue, what we want to do is we want to transfer the oxygen from the blood to our cells. And what, what, what inside cells requires oxygen? Mitochondria, yeah. So what we're trying to do is transfer oxygen to our mitochondria. And in mitochondria that are doing aerobic respiration, create a byproduct, carbon dioxide, that we want to transfer to our blood. So the transfers are opposite. So in an external respiration, we're wanting to load our blood with oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide from our blood. In internal respiration, we want to remove the oxygen from our blood and supply it to the mitochondria in our cells. And then we want to collect the byproducts of cellular respiration, carbon dioxide, from our cells and dump it into our blood. So the three things we, we accomplish with a respiratory system is simply the movement of air in and out of your body, pulmonary ventilation, external respiration, the movement of oxygen into the blood, carbon dioxide out of the blood, and then internal respiration, which is the movement of oxygen out of the blood and carbon dioxide in the blood. <clears throat> so we're going to cover this in lab. We're going to cover this in lab. We're going to cover that in lab. We're, we're, I just want to show this picture, talk about this picture. This is really kind of cool. Um, you can actually go to the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and they have this, this web-based uh, photograph area. And there was a, a prisoner who was on death row who donated his body to science after he was put to death. And what they did is they froze him with liquid nitrogen so that he was really, really frozen. And then they used a grinder and grind it a 16th inch off at a time, starting with his head all the way to his feet. And then they polished it and took an image of each section. And so you can go to this web page and see a human body every 16th of an inch. All right. So this is actually his thoracic region. And so here's the heart where we're seeing the chambers of the heart. And then here is the esophagus. Uh, continuing down <coughs> behind it. And then here are the two lungs that are sitting side by side. And so one thing we can see if we draw a midline is that, and this is the linea alba between the two uh, erectile, uh, the two uh, dominal rectal muscles, then the heart is not equally proportioned. But the heart actually sits further in the left thoracic cavity and in the right side of the thoracic cavity. Because of that, then the heart displaces lungs. So your right lung is actually much larger than your left lung. And your right lung has three lobes, of which they're divided by these fissures that we can see right here. And your, your right lung has three lobes, and your left lung only has two lobes, divided by that fissure there. So it's really cool to see that in this picture. And we're going to cover this. And we're going to talk about a couple things here. So the lung, like the liver, like the kidney, is divided into subunits called lobes. And then lobes are divided into subunits called lobes. All right. So the big things we were just looking at were this, the big subdivisions, the lobes, 
And then each lobe is made up of a small subdivision called a lobule. And a lobule is a terminal bronchioli and all of the exchange surface that it feeds. So in your lungs, exchange surfaces are increased by a folding pattern that creates little circular uh, entities that we call alveoli or alveolus for plural. And so they're like a grape. And then if you stick a whole bunch of grapes together, like you buy them in the store, you would end up with an alveolar sac. So this whole thing is an alveolar sac. Each one of these is an alveoli. And the whole reason for doing this is surface area again, increasing surface area. So one of the fundamental things that's, probably, that's critical to your body and your survival is that you have an adequate surface area in your lungs to diffuse carbon dioxide and oxygen. And surface area is going to become critical to that process. All right. So the other thing that's critical to movement of gases by diffusion is the distance at which the gas has to travel. Okay. All tubes are lined with epithelial cells. And if you look at our choices of epithelial cells, then we have squamous cells. We have cuboid cells and we have columnar cells. So which one of these would have the shortest diffusion distance for a gas? Squamous. So it's not surprising that the cell of choice uh, that lines these alveoli are squamous cells, because they create a shortened diffusion distance. Right? So what lines each alveolus is a layer of simple squamous, and we call them type 1 alveolar cells. And their primary role is diffusion. Now, what's one of the tenets of, of epithelial tissue? It always sits on a basement membrane. So just outside of this epithelial cell, we're going to have a basement membrane. And then what we have on our alveoli are capillary beds, where ACE would be found. And we have these capillary beds, all right? So the capillary is a little blood vessel lined with endothelium. So endothelium is what type of epithelium? Simple squamous epithelium. So the lining of your, of your capillary bed is simple squamous epithelium and its basement membrane. So what we do with an alveoli is create the shortest distance that we can possibly create using tissues as a diffusion distance. And what we have is we have the alveolar space, we have the type 1 alveolar cell, its basement membrane, a tiny bit of interstitial space, the basement membrane of the capillary bed, and the capillary bed in the filial cell. So simple squamous basement membrane, tiny space, basement membrane, simple squamous. And by doing that, we create the shortest exchange distance that we can for carbon dioxide Oxygen. Okay. So the two principles that are always going to be important when you're thinking about how the respiratory system works, total surface area and distance that one has to move a gas. Okay? So when you actually look at lung tissue, then these are alveoli. And what you can see is they're, they're living with tiny bridges. So there's a type 1 septal cell here, basement membrane, capillary bed, Type 1 septal cell here, and basement membrane and then capillary bed. So not only are you diffusing uh, oxygen into the capillary bed from one surface, but from two surfaces. So by creating these, these bridges where you have the type 1 septal cell, type 1 septal cell, and then the capillary bed sandwiched in between, is you can not only move oxygen carbon dioxide on this surface, but you can move oxygen and carbon dioxide on that surface. So by creating these dinky little bridges, we, we supply this enormous surface area for the diffusion of gases. But what we trade is a tissue that becomes incredibly fragile. So the trade-off is an enormous surface area to a tissue that can be very easily damaged. And that's the trade-off that that's made in our lungs to, to allow us to 
diffuse ourselves. Okay. So we're going to do this in lab on Tuesday. So let's get that. All right. So the way we move, the way we do pulmonary ventilation is by creating <coughs> pressure differences. All right. And so what we need to do in relationship to the atmosphere in our body and our lungs. Somebody with a big hand. And here's our lungs. Is that we want to create an empty pressure in our lungs. And we want the air to be in a higher pressure here. And an air is that air is always going to move from an area of high pressure to low pressure. So to move air, we have to create a negative pressure and a positive pressure. And an air will always move from an area of high pressure to an area of, of low pressure. So the way we do that is play a game with volume. So what we do is we use the muscles we just skipped that we're going to go over on Tuesday to actually change the volume of our thoracic cavity. So when you're breathing heavily, you can actually see that. Or we greatly increase the volume when I breathe in and greatly decrease the volume when you breathe out. So the reason that works is because of a, a, a chemist physicist named Boyle that created Boyle's Law. And what Boyle's Law says is pressure is inversely related to volume. So that if I have a volume of one liter, that I have a given pressure. And so when we're dealing with, with pressures in our air, we use one atmosphere as a normal pressure. So one atmosphere typically only occurs at sea level. But, so we have one atmosphere of pressure. Okay? Then what we'll see is we take one atmosphere and we convert it to a measurement, which would be millimeters of mercury just like it was in blood. So if I decrease the volume by half, so I go from one liter to a half a liter, the pressure will increase, will double. Now I have two atmospheres of pressure. So what I do with, this, the, with my respiratory muscles, the diaphragm and the other respiratory muscles, is actually change the volume in your lungs. And as you change volume, you change pressure. So when the brain stem sends a signal to your diaphragm via the phrenic nerve to contract, then the diaphragm drops. As the diaphragm drops, the volume in your lungs increases. So if the volume in your lung increases, then the pressure inside the lungs will decrease. And as soon as pressure in your lungs drops below atmospheric pressure, then air will flow from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure, okay? So when the diaphragm relaxes, it domes back up. So when the diaphragm domes up, thoracic volume decreases. Therefore, pressure inside the lungs will increase. And as soon as the pressure in the lungs exceeds atmospheric pressure, air will flow out. So we use muscles to change volume so that we can change pressure. And we use pressure differences to breathe. Okay. So that's what they're saying here. So at rest, we have three pressures we have to think about. We have the pressure of the atmosphere around us. And so we consider that atmospheric pressure. And atmospheric pressure of 760 on this chart would be something that we would find if you were down on the, the shore in Seattle at, at, at sea level. What calls it? Yeah. So at sea level, you would have that pressure. In Spokane, typically we won't have that pressure. So that's why when you go up in elevation, it gets harder to Because pressures are changing. So what happens if you go to skin down? And then the pressure starts going 
Oh, yeah. All right. So the pressure in your lungs is called alveolar pressure because what we're really interested in is what the pressure is inside this little thing where the exchange occurs, right? And then because the lungs are in a cavity, we have a membrane that defines the outside of the cavity, which is the parietal membrane. We have a membrane found on the surface of the organ, which is the visceral membrane. We name the organs for the cavity that they line. So your lungs are in the pleural cavity. So therefore, this membrane becomes the parietal pleura. And this membrane becomes the visceral pleura. And those membranes create a cavity that then has a pressure in it. And so that pressure is intrapleural pressure, the pressure between uh, the two visceral, the, the visceral and parietal membranes. So the relationship that's constant is that intrapleural pressure always has to be less than alveolar pressure. So this pressure always has to be less than. And if something changes that, your lung collapses and doesn't work. So one of the things we, in a clinical setting we would be concerned about would be a gunshot wound, knife wound, <coughs> or the knife penetrated between the ribs, the gunshot penetrated between the ribs, and actually uh, penetrated the parietal pleura. Because as soon as the parietal pleura is compromised, then the air will suck in from the atmosphere into that space and then it will equalize and, and elevate to atmospheric pressure. As soon as that happens, the lung on that side collapses and will not inflate again. So the lung becomes inoperative. So that's always the concern with the chest wounds uh, from a car wreck where a rib penetrates it to gunshot wounds and knife wounds is that you get a collapsed lung and then it gets no longer functional. So what we then try to do is change the pressure by dropping our diaphragm. So when we drop our diaphragm, the volume <coughs> increases, so therefore pressure decreases. So over here, we were at equal, 760, 760. Over here now, the pressure is less, the alveolar pressure is less. So we can move air from here to here. But notice that intrapleural pressure dropped as well. And intrapleural pressure is still lower than alveolar pressure. So when you breathe out, the diaphragm domes and volume decreases. So as volume decreases, pressure increases according to Boyle's law. And then what happens then is the alveolar pressure goes up to 762. So now air is going to flow from a high pressure to a low pressure, and you're going to vacate air. Notice that intrapleural pressure went up, but it still stayed lower than alveolar pressure. That's kind of a cool pressure system to be used. We'll demonstrate that tomorrow um, with, I mean on Tuesday with, with a glass jar that's really kind of good. And it's out if you want to play with it. This just reiterates the same thing, so I'm going to just go over that. So now because we're using pressure, then we're actually causing our little alveolus to increase in size when we breathe in and then decrease in size when we breathe out. So the alveolus is actually changing in size. So what happens is your lungs are designed to stretch and recoil. And a recoil component is critically important, but you don't want it to recoil too much because if it recoils too much, then you're going to collapse it, just like we talked about with pressure itself. So what happens is that to diffuse something across this surface, the surface has to be moist. And our way that we moist all surfaces is to use water as an agent. As a, so every exchange surface in your lungs has to be moist. If they dry out, you cannot exchange gas. So that's why people die in fires typically from smoke inhalation is the fact that it dries their lungs and they cannot then exchange gas uh, with dry lungs. So that's always a concern in the fire is that superheated air dries your lungs out. So the problem with water is it's a polar molecule. And 
hydrogen and water likes to hydrogen bond to one another. And then that hydrogen bonding creates tension on a surface. So you can surf and stand on top of water, but you cannot walk on water. Because if you just place your weight over a large enough surface area, you don't break the hydrogen bonding of water molecules. And you don't break the surface tension of water. But if you have too much weight on too small of area, you break the surface tension and you sink. So that always was amazing to me when I thought about it. Wow. Now we can take an aircraft carrier that literally weighs tons. And if we make that thing big enough, we can float it on the ocean. That is pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. The problem with hydrogen bonding is it causes surfaces to want to recoil more. So the dilemma we have, because we use water, is we increase the chances of collapsing our alveoli because of this surface tension. So to get by with that, what we do is we have a cell that's called a type 2 septal cell. And type 2 septal cells produce a compound called surfactant. And surfactant breaks up hydrogen bonding in water molecules. So it decreases surface tension. So I, the scale, you couldn't do it with the scale, but I thought, you know, that's pretty cool if you do that. If you could take a bunch of surfactant, you could mix it in the water around an aircraft carrier. The aircraft carrier would sink. Because there wouldn't be hydrogen bonding to keep it on the surface. But the scale would be enormous. So what's kind of interesting clinically is when babies are born prematurely at the end of the 7th month, the 8th month, they're always in an intensive care unit, neonatal intensive care unit, because their lungs collapse. Their lungs collapse because at that age of seven months, these cells are not active. So they don't produce surfactant. And when they were inside mom, that wasn't an issue because there wasn't any air in their lungs. There was liquid in their lungs. So what we've done is create a liquid that we can pump in newborn baby and premature baby lung to prevent them from collapsing. So it's really kind of cool. So, so the surface tension becomes critically important. So the thing that has to happen again is that when we breathe in, these alveoli have to expand a little bit, and then when we breathe out, they have to contract a little bit. So that recoil is critically important to creating the pressure differences that we need to create. So when we think of, from a clinical standpoint, like a a respiratory therapist who deals with pulmonary ventilation, uh, then we use the word compliance. And so to maintain homeostasis, we want to be in compliance. We want our chest cavity to expand and recoil easily. And things that prohibit the chest cavity from expanding and recoiling easily or preventing alveoli from expanding and recoiling easily then make us out of compliance. And then when we're out of compliance, we have trouble doing pulmonary ventilation. And so we have trouble doing exchanging gases. We have trouble doing external respiration and internal respiration. So from a clinical standpoint, somebody who has asthma or COPD is in a chronic state where they have trouble doing pulmonary ventilation. And so they're always at the edge of whether they can take in enough gas exchange to keep themselves going well. So if anything happens that pushes them a little further out of compliance, then they get into trouble. And so most of them carry inhalation agents that if they have a attack, they can use a chemical that's going to alter the way this expansion and recoil is going in their lungs and help them breathe again. Okay. So, so then what we're always concerned about is things that uh, cause a decrease in compliance from a clinical setting, the ability to, to uh, exchange gases. 
So one of the things that would be critical is a bacterial infection called tuberculosis. And now we have antibiotic resistant tuberculosis. So we're now playing a little game of evolution with bacteria and, tu and the tuberculosis. Uh, and, and we're actually losing that game because now we've got multiple antibiotic resistant tuberculosis and not just one. So what happens with tuberculosis is the bacteria damage the lung. The lung tissue is replaced by connective tissue, which is scar tissue. And then the scar tissue is less elastic. So we lose compliance. We can't, we can't uh, repo. Before antibiotics, tuberculosis was a death sentence that you weren't going to get over. So there was a movie that was out, Moulin Rouge, where there was the performances on stage, and she bleeds to hell, her mouth starts bleeding, she dies right on stage. She died from tuberculosis. That was the classic kind of, what would tuberculosis look like in the final stages of life? That was the movie. a little sensational. And then pulmonary edema, which is the retention of fluids in your lungs. So why do we want ACE to be created by these capillaries? Because ACE causes the kidney to make more urine or less urine? More urine. So you want the lungs to say, hey, I'm drowning up here. Start working and get rid of more fluid, right? So there's the beauty of the connection between the respiratory system and the urine. Is that we can try to control pulmonary edema. So in a clinical setting, you'd see pulmonary edema with, with uh, congestive heart failure, a couple of things like that. But in a, in, a, in a modality where you see it a lot is in, in mountain climbing. Because what happens as you go up in a mountain, all these pressures change. Because it's higher and higher and higher. The pressure is different, different, and different. So Ross Kelly, who is one of the world premier climbers to, from Spokane here, has attempted Everest five times and made it twice. And the times he didn't make it, he nearly died from pulmonary edema, from, from fluid retention in his lungs. So then uh, another climber, Jeff Lowell, who almost died from pulmonary edema, then got to thinking about it and thinking about these pressures. And he created a bag, a bag that looks like a sleeping bag but it's impermeable to air and a pump. And so now if you're in pulmonary edema on your way up to Everest and it doesn't look like you're going to make it, you can stick it in the bag, pump the bag up, increase pressure, change the pressure, decrease edema. <laughs> Where is ACE produced? ACE is produced by the cells that line the capillaries of the lungs. All right. So then we already talked about respiratory distress in, in infants because of the lack of surfactant. And paralysis of respiratory muscles, that one's pretty straightforward. If you don't have the muscles to change your rib cage, then you can't breathe very well. So that happens in, in, in spinal cord injuries that occur in the neck area where people sometimes have to be on respiratory machines because they can no longer respire. Um, so the guy that, that recently passed away that was Superman, he actually had a upper neck fracture, and he actually had a a little respiratory unit on his on his uh, wheelchair that helped him respire. And so, uh, then the other one is emphysema. So, what's really critical to stretch and recoil is elastic fibers in connective tissue, and they're the ones that allow us to stretch and recoil. And in emphysema, we get the destruction of the alveolar walls and the elastic fibers in, 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 the, uh, in the basement membrane. And so it creates problems for us. I'm going to go over this in the lab. I'm going to go over this in the lab. Uh, so airway resistance is a, another issue. So airway resistance can occur because You've swallowed something that's stuck in the top of your larynx. Or airway resistance can occur because normally 
the smaller tubes in our lung, we can change their diameter. But people with COPD tend to have them constricted all the time and can't increase their sizes. So with COPD, you get airway resistance as well. So what we have to use is an inhalation agent that relaxes smooth muscle so the airways will dilate. And so normally we want to dilate and constrict our airways, but with people with COPD, oftentimes they clear state and constrict it. They don't want to dilate and we have to have it. Uh, and then emphysema and bronchitis, which is an irritation of the, the, the epithelium. So if you have a chest cold and you're just it sounds real, every time you breathe in, it sounds gurgly. You're producing a gob of mucus because you've got an irritation. And so that would be classic bronchitis. That you don't want to settle in your lungs because then it returns to pneumonia where you drown yourself. Okay. So is pneumonia type of pulmonary edema or is it pneumonia? It causes, it causes pulmonary edema. Why would we get a collapsed lung from pneumonia? Um, those, if it's a bacterial infection, bacteria produced by products of production. So therefore they change the, the chemical nature, which then changes the parameter of pressure. All right, so I, I'll, we'll do these in my afternoon. Well, I forgot to do this one the first time. So let me do this real quick for you, and then we'll get the two will make sense. And we'll do it in the lab. So one of the things we have a problem with is if dust particles get down into our lungs, then dust particles act like bowling balls. And every time you breathe in, the dust particles get slammed against this wall, slammed against that wall. And what they do over time is they take little alveoli and break the walls down between them. And then you end up with a giant airspace. But what you just lose? A bunch of surface area. Okay. So one of the things that's problematic is dust particles and other things like asbestos fibers, they get into your lungs, they get bounced around and destroy these bridges. So what you have is you have a, a white blood cell called an alveolar macrophage. And macrophage is designed to destroy bacteria and viruses, which it can digest because it has the enzymes. But it also picks up dust particles and stuff. But it can't digest dust particles because they're not digestible by enzymes. And so what it has to do then is travel to the surface, travel through the capillary network toward the surface of the lungs, and deposit those dust particles on the surface of the lungs. So throughout your life, these, macro, these little macrophages are taking dust out of your lungs and putting them on the surface of the lungs. So when you look at someone's lungs uh, after they've died, what we see is a kind of a cool pattern. So this is an autopsy. Just to give you a just to give you a, a kind of organization, this is a stomach with the greater momentum. This is the diaphragm right here, liver over here. These are the lungs. This is the heart, but it's still covered by the private pericardium, so you can't see it. And what we do is we start at the top of the lungs, the apex, and we start depositing these dust particles. And so all this black stuff is dust that this person has inhalated over their lungs, has been deposited on the first surface of their lungs. All right. So the more dust you're exposed to, then the more, the more your lungs look like this. So this is a normal lung with a lot of dust particles. This is somebody who was exposed to a tremendous load of dust that has been deposited on the surface of the lungs. So this is actually a, a two-a-pack day smoker that died from emphysema. And this is the, the particulate matter from the smoke. But if you had somebody who worked in a coal mine, then they often died to die of a disease called black lung. Now you know where the name black lung came from. They were exposed to all that fine dust particles all their lives. The macrophages delivered it to the surface of the lungs. So when they did an autopsy, their lungs were black. And so black, yes. So the dust particles you, particles you picked up 10 years ago are still there on the surface of your yeah. lungs? Yeah. Hmm. 
And it was something that's cool. It dealt with animals. It's doable with humans. Uh, it is, if the dust is natural dust, then there are unique types of dust in certain parts of the world. And you can look at the dust on the lungs and see if the animals in a different part of the world. Which is kind of cool. All right. So, and then this is just cancer. Uh, we'll talk about this in the lab. So somebody with metastatic lung cancer that, that uh, died from it. Uh, this is black lung. So not only is the surface of this lung black, but the entire inside is was all dark because there's so much dust that's going in. Uh, and they're doing better now, making people wear protection. And then this is uh, this is actually scarring from tuberculosis on the lungs. Right. So. So you're gonna find out I'm an avid non-smoker because because I know I I looked at cadaver lungs and stuff. They're just black and and cadavers at 52 <laughs> instead of 85. And my dad died at 42 of uh, smoking related illnesses uh, when I was in seventh grade. So I can't wait to call. So I've been a non-smoker. I don't pick on people who smoke because I also understand the the addiction of nicotine and stuff. But so every once in a while, I I kind of look at data based upon that. And so this is out of the environmental health perspective. So why not? Because I'm a wildlife biologist, as my other kind of thing I like to do in biology. I've always been fascinated about how the world around us impacts our health and how things we do impact our health. And so it's a combination of natural things and unnatural things. So this was a uh, this was in uh, volume uh, 114, uh, and then that's the page number. But anyway, what they did is they looked at children who had uh, attention deficit disorder, and they then backtracked and looked at parents that smoked while these while the woman was pregnant or parents that smoke around kids. And what they found was that children whose mothers smoked during pregnancy were two and a half times more, more likely to have attention deficit disorder in the United States. So one of the things we've seen is an increase in attention deficit disorder. So anytime you see that, then you want to, then you, what you have to do is try to figure out is it a true increase or is it an increase because we're better at catching it and we just had a lot of patients in the past that we didn't catch that had into deficit disorder. So it looks like we're having more of it when really we're not. But when you take this data and then you look at the increase in smoking by women starting in the 50s and 60s, then the correlation is pretty pretty significant. So it was, it was by looking at two studies, pretty interesting to look at. And then the other one was just something I found because we have lead, we have lead issues out of the mining in northern Idaho. And so the other thing I found that was quite interesting was that children who we do blood analysis on that have two micrograms uh, per deciliter of <coughs> lead are four times more likely to have attention deficit disorder. And in fact, in Kellogg and Wallace and a couple of communities where the lead poisoning has been been pretty significant in kids, we, we do see a pretty big increase in attention deficit disorder in those populations. So, and then the key was 0.8 micrograms, so four times likely. So if you go from 0.8 to 2, the, the, the likelihood goes way up. So one would think then that if you look at data like this, you could set a standard and you'd say that 0.8 would be the standard we would want to be concerned about with kids kids uh, lead poisoning to look at the attention deficit disorder. But uh, the acceptable government level right now is 10 micrograms per year, which is somewhat problematic for attention deficit disorder. Yeah. So at 10 micrograms per liter, we were, the estimate is about 310 children uh, Increase in attention deficit disorder. Did you come on the ads with the reason? Oh, uh, yeah. Because Good Morning America the taught the children of the two and a half and a half. just talked about that last week. I had just about. Uh, 
probably two or three years ago. Wow. It just lasts out. Yeah. You know, by the time, you know, it's kind of interesting depending upon where you get your, your information. So if it's in public media, like news or something, it's usually a couple of years late. Uh, one of the, there's one show I always like. It's on public radio. It's a Science and Matter. And I always listen to that uh, because they're really current. I mean, they, they report stuff that's it just published. So I can listen to it and keep current and find out things that I have to go explore and work so. so we're going to do this in lab on Tuesday. This is the whole point of Tuesday's lab. So we'll cover this. Right. So what I want to do is I want to look at factors that well, I want to look at factors that are going to affect our ability to respire. So let me do a couple of premises, take home things to think about. The first thing is we cannot live on Earth without hemoglobin. It would be totally impossible for us to be this size and be able to deliver enough oxygen to our tissues if we didn't have hemoglobin. We would all be single cell critters swimming around in a pond <laughs> where delivery of oxygen wasn't a problem. Secondly, we could not live outside of water for any extended period of time without hemoglobin. So we would all be mermaids and mermaids. So then what the real key is, is being able to deliver oxygen to hemoglobin and being able to remove oxygen from hemoglobin. So we want to add oxygen to hemoglobin and external respiration. And we want to remove oxygen from hemoglobin in internal respiration. So what we have to do is create a way in which we can add oxygen to hemoglobin in one situation but remove it in another situation. So what we're going to see is it's a combination of things. It's the partial pressure of a gas. It's the alveolar surface area, which we've already talked about. It's the diffusion rate and distance, part of which we've already talked about. And it's the solubility of a gas in a water, because you've got to move it from air through the liquid lining of the lungs into the blood. So you've got to move the oxygen from gas into a dissolved gas to move it into the body. And then hemoglobin is critical to that process. So, what we're going to talk about quickly, which you need to read about, is Dalton's law. So, what Dalton says is that the atmosphere can only contain 100% of any gas. And of the gases we know that make up the majority, nitrogen makes up about 78% of the atmosphere, which I thought was kind of a cool ploy to make people spend money was putting nitrogen in tires and paying to have nitrogen put in tires. Because if they're just using a compressor, there's already 78% nitrogen in the tire. So 21% oxygen and less than 1% carbon dioxide. And then anything else we put in the air, carbon monoxide, all adds up to this. So what you have to understand is if we change one of these, everything has to change, right? So what if we add more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere? Oxygen or nitrogen is going to decrease. So what we hope is nitrogen. Yeah. All right. So that's kind of cool. So if we, if we just say what I'm really worried about is this, then all you do is if you assume that the value of this 100% pressure is 760, then 760 times 0.21 gives you the, the pressure of oxygen. And so that's where this table came from, was just taking, taking the percentage in the atmosphere times the total pressure of the atmosphere and arising it. So at sea level, we have about 160 millimeters of mercury of oxygen itself. As we go away from sea level, because the Earth is a centrifuge, the amount of oxygen decreases. 
So at the top of Everest, there's only a 673 uh, partial pressure of oxygen, which is why most climbers can't make it to the top of Everest without additional oxygen. So if you ever wondered when you get on a jet plane, and it says the jet plane is cruising at uh, 40,000 feet, if the plane decompresses, these little things will fall out and see when we put them on. Because at 40,000 feet, there will be more oxygen in your blood than in the air, and your lungs will reverse without those numbers. That's why they always say, cut yours on first before you help someone else. Because you might not be able to help someone else if you wait too long. But I never worry about that. So 40,000 feet, if the plane D is decompressed, it means it's got a hole. So the plane's going to come apart anyway. <laughs> so I don't know that I want that mask on. I don't know that I want to know that the plane is coming apart. And 40,000 feet, the temperature will freeze you in about 15 minutes. Four minutes to, and your brain turns off without oxygen. 15 minutes and you freeze to go slowly. So I never 